Renee Brussel in Carmel, California. This is tape number 365A, and it's December the 1st, 1978. This may be kind of a rambling tape for you because it's really hard for me to put my feelings together. I'm kind of punchy. It'll be two weeks tomorrow since the shootings took place down in Ghana. And for those of you that live in California, I don't have to describe the media barrage that we've had uh, on television and radio constantly. Usually I stick with news over the printed word, and we're going to be talking about the killing of Congressman Ryan and the people down in Ghana and the People's Temple and then the culmination of the murder of Mayor Moscone in San Francisco and a member of the Board of Supervisors there, Mr. Harvey Milk. Uh, all this came down within a short period of time, and I'm going to try to make some sense out of it, if I can, for you and for myself. I've worked hard on it the last two weeks, and I think I can give you an overall summary view of what I see. And then in the next few weeks, I'll give you the specifics to fill in the uh, picture. I'll give you the outline now of the way I've broken down the Guyana, San Francisco mess. And then you can follow that outline if you have the patience or are so inclined and then read the news that came out preceding or in the future and see it along the framework that I'm seeing it. It didn't surprise me that the next stage after the Zodiac killings in California and the zebra killings and the SLA and the Strangler and the Manson family massacres and all of these other bloody California syndromes that I've talked about for so long, it didn't surprise me that out of that racism, out of that counterintelligence operation and the meanness of the powers that be that run our state and federal offices, that such a thing could happen as happened in Guyana. But it didn't surprise me, but I don't like to say I told you so, and I don't want to tell you how bad the future is going to be, but... I still feel pretty sick about this, and uh, if you get Newsweek and Time this week and People magazine, I think that one picture is worth a thousand words, and you should get these and look at them uh, and take whatever information you can out of them and remember what happened here. Uh, not only did this massacre take place down in Guyana, but what followed was the most intense racism, the way it was handled, and the collusion of the federal government. And those are the things that we'll go into for the next few weeks. Uh, the relationship I see that of this event down there to my past research on the assassinations and the, the SLA and, as I say, the California violences. Of course, one common denominator through all of this, going from the Kennedy assassination right up to what time, Newsweek has on the cover that called it death, is Mark Lane. He's prominent at both ends of the spectrum. He was right there in Dallas with Marina Oswald as soon as John Kennedy was killed, and he was out there hanging in a tree or in a swamp at the time that these people died down in Guyana. And next week on the tape, I think for those of you that don't live in California and didn't hear it, I'll reproduce his press conference, uh, the one he had in San Francisco a month ago, what he said about the People's Temple and then his interview when he came home from Guyana. He had a press conference Wednesday, October the 4th, 1978, in San Francisco, in which he said Jim Jones and the People's Temple was being harassed. The headline there was People's Temple Colony Harassed, and that uh, he said he was satisfied that the concentration camp charges against Jonestown, Jonestown were false, and he thought that uh, people had been misused who made these remarks. He declined to name the agent that he had talked to, but he hinted because Jim Jones had been harassed that he was going to file this large multi-million dollar lawsuit in 90 days, and he was going to name as defendants the FBI, the CIA, the Department of State, the Internal Revenue Service, the Treasury Department, the Postal Service, because he said there's a conspiracy against 1,200 people 1,200 American expatriates. It's an embarrassment to the government because of its tremendous success down there. And uh, he said that uh, it was a beautiful place to live. The People's Temple also got out a newsletter, which they mailed to me October 21, 1978. Mark Lane said, in quotes, I've been deeply impressed with what I've seen there at Jonestown. 
It makes me almost weep to see such an incredible experience with such vast potential for the human spirit and soul of this country to be cruelly assaulted by our intelligence agents. And then Charles Gary, the attorney for People's Temple, said he went to Jonestown, and he enthusiastically refers to that as a community where racism, sexism, and ageism have been overcome as a new social order, an answer to a better life. And Don Freed, they're quite a trio, Don Freed, Charles Gary, and Mark Lane. I've known them quite a few years, Mark the longest. Don Freed said in the news release, in quotes, Martin Luther King, I think, if he could see Jonestown, would recognize it in the next step in his agenda, and he would say, one, two, three, many more Jones towns. And then the Sun reporter out in the Bay Area had some more press conference of Mark Lane. He told about Federal Communications hassling them because they wanted a shortwave station for doctors to get medical care for to save lives. And now it turns out that on that shortwave they had all kinds of coded messages and even discussed with Charles Gary the plans to kill 1,200 people down there if necessary. In this press conference, Lane described Jonestown as a model community. The visits there gave him a glimpse of the future. He added that the government of Guyana is particularly pleased at the success of the People's Temple since it is a model for other Caribbean countries to follow. That was Mark Lane. He described the education of people in Jonestown as more sophisticated and successful than in the United States schools. And these men said there was no sexism, uh, there's no ageism, there's no racism. He said they had education. Then Mark Lane said there's no money in Jonestown. There is no need for it. And, of course, what followed, uh, according to Mr. Layton, one of the suspects for killing Congressman Ryan, they said there was a footlocker of $3 million cash being taken out in the woods, and then there were millions of dollars in Swiss bank accounts and in Guyana, which would total many, many millions of dollars. And then it turns out these people were crowded in rooms like a slave ship and worked 12-hour shifts and cried for food, and the white staff had meals and regular meals and dinners, and the blacks worked out in the fields. Only two people worked in the fields that weren't black, and they were forced to work and grow the food out there. Mark Lane said there's no money in Jonestown and no need for it, and they were taking gold from these people and diamonds and jewelry and uh, personal objects and, and accrued from them and other monies millions and millions of dollars. He was particularly impressed, Mark Lane, by the quality of medical care at Jonestown, where the community's 1,200 inhabitants are served by 70 health workers. Natives cared free of charge for Indians, Native Indians, he said, uh, and Albert Schweitzer's famous hospital in Africa was compared to what Jim Jones was doing in Jonestown. Uh, that's why I want to play the tape for you next week. So you can hear Mark Lane rave about the medical clinic that people came all over the world to see and the accredited college. Uh, I'm particularly quoting Mark Lane to start my series on this because I'm very proud to say that I've hated his guts and tried to expose him for years. And any of you that listen to KGO in the San Francisco area, the all-day talk show, it goes on all day and night. I've been tape recording uh, people just lambasting Mark Lane and Charles Gary, and really out for their guts and outraged at what they did in calming the people and knowing what they knew in advance, what they know now, their attorneys, and uh, you should hear what my complaints were about Lane. The public has taken over because they now have seen for the first time what he is. As I say, he was impressed by the medical quality of Jonestown. They had 70 health workers serving only 1,200 Native Americans that had been taken down there compared to Albert Schweitzer's. He said he even had a two-and-a-half-hour physical exam during one visit to Jonestown. Those are three different press releases that came out just exactly one month before this terrible rash of murders took place. In contrast to that, the San Francisco Chronicle has an article, and you'll be seeing a lot more about this subject, uh, Tuesday, November 28th. Robot behavior, a Ryan murder suspect. Lawrence Layton, the man charged with killing Congressman Leo Ryan, displayed increasingly peculiar behavior even before he left for Guyana last May. 
Larry, too, was in, seemed a post-hypnotic trance. He was drawn into the People's Temple farther in since he joined in 1968. He came home once to his family in East Bay in a full surgical gown, jumped into the swimming pool. His brother, Tom Layton, 36 years old, wondered if his brother was hypnotized and turned into a robot to take orders. And he said he was a robot. The father, Lawrence Layton, said his son was a robot. I called Lawrence Layton this week on the telephone, and I'll give you some more of that conversation. His wife had died down in Jonestown. One daughter, Debbie, had escaped and is under guard 24 hours a day because she's the one who was blowing the whistle. And it's the one son that down there that's being charged with the murder of Congressman Ryan and the others, the shootout. Uh, they said that they believed that he was a robot when he came home and that he had taken orders. And they were wondering, the Layton family wondered what protection he would have at a trial since he seemed to be a robot in the hands of Jim Jones. And the father is a professor at San Jose State, I believe, and he's taught at the University of California and recognized that his son was really in a post-hypnotic state. The San Jose Mercury, November 29th, 1978, has a two-page article and I, from my papers, 10 papers a day. I'm just inundated with news. But this uh, two-page article here just uh, counteracts the kind of bullshit that Mark Lane was saying a month ago. And Charles Gary knew about it. He was very revealing on KGO this week. But the San Jose Mercury just gave some examples. It, Jim Jones had said to the people down there, you complain that we watch every move and we judge you. It's true. I make allowances for what I see you doing that seems other than it should be. And on the other hand, I watch your pain and it tears me up. He had a population there of 80 to 90 percent black. He was described as being a secret racist, that he wanted to enslave and kill as many blacks as possible. A man named uh, Richard Clayton said that he thought the whole purpose was to kill as many blacks as possible. He really only trusted whites, said Juanita Bogue, a 21-year-old survivor, one of the two whites out of 75 who worked in the fields. Her sister was the other. If a black person accused a white person of being a racist, Jones would respond to make, him th make you think he was a racist himself, and he would praise all white people. In the radio room, in the office, they were all white. He'd pit whites against blacks. He had a, a area, a constructed area, where they would meet, and he'd argue that whites should be consumed with guilt and they make blacks suffer. And then he would tell them in the loudspeakers that the best workers he has are whites. Uh, Mrs. Bogue said he was pushing racism wherever he could. And uh, after he arrived in Georgetown, he had a religious proclamation on the steps of a Georgetown Catholic Church, which I think is interesting, and then went into Jonestown where he stayed until he died. This was Jim Jones. This particular article tells about isolation and power, and I'll give you more about people being stripped nude and forced uh, to swim in the swimming pool in front of people and then were beaten, beaten till they were bloodied. Uh, they had no freedom. You couldn't leave. If you talked about it, you got a beating, and you were put on public demonstration. A crime down there was to talk about wanting to go back to the United States. One man talked about it, Gerald Parks, and he was dragged at 5.30 in the morning out of a jail cell and put digging ditches for 12 hours, and he couldn't get a break from 5.30 in the morning till evening, and he had to keep doing that down in Jonestown. Uh, the labor was free. The slave labor built a house for Jim Jones, and he had a screen door and a mosquito net, which nobody else had down there, and then he'd pour over his files, he used all kinds of drugs and amphetamines and injections. And the other people slept in community rooms that were 14 people to a room, 10 by 12, in a climate like that that is very warm and sticky. The room is 12, 10 by 12 feet, and 14 people lived in that cottage with no way out. There was a port uh, cut off, the Port Katuma, and there was no escape from that island. There was absolutely no way to escape, and the blacks worked 12 hours a day. They got a spoonful or two spoonful of rice, and they wrote letters, some of them, about passing by the windows and seeing the food and other people eating it. Now, Jim Jones had tremendous sexual hang-ups, and we'll go into some of those as time goes on on the other tapes, but Mark Lane had a press conference, no racism and no sexism. 
he complained that his penis was too big and, and that he had to suffer by relieving himself all the time. And he taught people to be homosexuals. He told them the virtue of homosexuality. The men were to sleep with men, women with women, and he said that way you didn't produce babies, which sounds more like Adolf Hitler than any kind of real socialism. This was uh, the same kind of socialism that Adolf Hitler had. And uh, there's a story here about several people, two people, that took a liking to each other. There's a man and a woman, young couple, and she worked in the bakery, and she allegedly gave him a cookie, and Jim Jones heard about it. So he put a mattress up on the stand of the pulpit there and made them take off their clothes and said they could make love right here and now burn in the mattress and try to get them to demonstrate because they took an attraction towards each other. This review in the Mercury, and this is just one article. I mean, I'm sure many of you have collected them in the last two weeks. He used people like playthings. He toyed with them. They were very simple. They had uh, some of them never a high school graduation. He picked guards that he carried that had guns around the camp that conformed to every thought, and it goes on to say that he had homosexual relations with all the guards. They were his lovers, and he announced it to the people, and those were the people that guarded the camp, and those a lot of the people that are down in Jonestown now under arrest or witnesses for the trial. Tim Carter uh, from Burlingame, California, former heroin addict, was Joan's PR man in Georgetown, and uh, uh, he's the one who uh, helped with the bullying around and uh, walking with the gun and scaring the people who were working and terrorizing them. Sometimes he would tell them they were going on a trip to Cuba, and they'd take one truck to a boat. Uh, there's a harbor there, the boat that goes out the river, and he'd make other people walk 15 miles to Port Katuma, and then the trip would be called off, and they didn't go to Cuba uh, that reminded me of the people that worked in the uh, Nazi concentration camp at IG Auschwitz that walked six miles to work and six miles back, and uh, rain or snow and no shoes, and if they died on the way, they died. And that's the way they worked. He walked these people. And uh, again, from this article in Mercury, Jones fidgeted and protested the visit of Ryan. He didn't want him to enter, and when he was allowed to walk in, the spell was cracked, and Jim Jones knew it. And uh, that was the beginning of the end. A box of cyanide had been delivered. A package came to Ryan's uh, compound to Richard Clark, and it was stored away in case uh, Ryan saw, Congressman Ryan saw something he wasn't supposed to see. And a member of the crowd broke ranks with Ryan when he was about to leave, and nine of them wanted to leave with him. And this article says, You should have seen Jones. He offered us money not to leave, uh, the person who was down there is recounting, and uh, they couldn't believe that a few could get out with Ryan, Congressman Ryan. They offered him money also in Washington, D.C., not to come, a large sum of money if he wouldn't come, but he turned it down and insisted on coming. I'll go back to quotations of many articles just in case you don't have them on future tapes, but uh, I just want to show you the sexism and the racism just from one article one day the type of stuff that's coming out and the robots, I think that's interesting because Lane was adamant against my talking about mind control in 1975 at the conspiracy conference in Boston. And I've said that many times when I was at Flo Kennedy's house in the summer, spring of 75. He said, I'll never appear with you publicly. People know you're crazy. There's no evidence of mind control in the United States. I wonder how deep his relationship was, this Jim Jones operation was going on. Uh, he came in the last month to be the attorney for Jim Jones. But how did Jones select Mark Lane, a man who was adamant against mind control and the intelligence using mind control, when that's what this operation was about, and Lane turned out to be their attorney? It's a very dangerous thing for two attorneys like Charles Gary and Mark Lane to assure the American people and the Congress and the news media of this enviable institute, medical institute, educational institute, the privileges. Lane said the reason the United States was fighting uh, this uh, operation of Jim Jones down in Guyana was that we were embarrassed by the success of what he could achieve. And it would be an embarrassment to the United States to see that people could leave the United States and live without drugs, without television. It turned out they were heavily drugged. They were tranquilized. They were tranquilizers, drugs in the food, drugs.
drugs everywhere, a laboratory filled with drugs, and Jones was on drugs. And uh, Mark Lane had said, the United States government is embarrassed because there's no sexism and no narcotics, and they're doing their thing so eloquently that it's a model for other countries that would embarrass any country to see. That was the Jonestown that Mark Lane described not a year ago, not two years ago, not even three, but uh, October 1978, one month before Congressman Ryan went down there. Now we get to the nitty-gritty of what is Jonestown about, what happened, what's going to happen in the future with the hitmen, the organized crime, the seven or eight million dollars cash to kill public officials, to kill newspaper people. What does it mean? How did it form? Where is it going? And that is what I'm going to do with you the rest of the time on this tape. I hope I can do the outline on this tape and on the other side so that we can go into the details uh, next week. But I took all of the information of the two weeks that came down, and I'm going to read you the outline that I'm working with. I've broken it into already into approximately uh, 70 different manila folders. And into each of these folders, I will put the articles that I've collected or the uh, write up the tapes from the radio talk shows going almost 24 hours a day for two weeks and into the future, and then come up with a story bigger and even more frightening uh, than the SLA article I wrote. The SLA is the CIA. Well, this is the baby of the SLA, and it produces a monster bigger because the questions I asked in 74 weren't answered. If they were answered, I promise you, we wouldn't have this in 78. If you don't have that article, you can order it from me. Uh, they're a dollar plus postage. Read it carefully. But this is the outline I'm doing on the Jonestown massacre. What happened, the history of it, and what it means to your future. In the first section, I have chronology of events because the chronology is always important. The date that Jim Jones went to Brazil, the day that he moved up to Ukiah, he goes to Brazil for a year and a half. He's with the CIA, then he has $100,000 and goes to Ukiah. The date he was in Bloomington, Indiana, years before Emily and William Harris were there, but what date was that equivalent to the Georgetown Foundation formed in Bloomington, Indiana, that Tom Charles Houston later was a part of in Spiro Agnew. The chronology of Jim Jones, of the land purchase, of the assurances of people that everything was going all right, their lives, when they appeared to be robots, anything that has to do with time sequences, We'll go into one section called chronology. Then always is the motive, the script, the summary of what is the camp about. I have five Roman numeral sections. This is section one with five sections under it. And always there's the motive. And when I do my research, I come up with what I think is the motive, and then I look for all the supporting evidence. And if it doesn't support what I think is the motive, I can change it later. But gauging by the two weeks of news in my past research, I would say that there was more to Jonestown than what you think was happening. I think that clinic of 70 medical people was for experimentation. I think it was to smear all the Democrats by giving him a role by being instrumental with everybody from Senator Humphrey and uh, uh, Shirley Chisholm and Bella Abzug or uh, the Carters and Willie Brown and Donnelly and uh, Mayor Moscone in San Francisco to smear all the Democrats and get them terribly involved with something that comes out corrupt and, and tainted with racism and murder and death. Uh, it outdoes Watergate. Watergate was in 72, and uh, the seeds of this came down in 72 and began to blossom in 73. I also think if you see the movie The Boys from Brazil, I would call this The Boys from Guiana. I think uh, the contingency plan, and I'm going to go into that, that's uh, Next, underneath here in this first Roman numeral section that I have, one, the script was to have a place to experiment on black people, mind control, electrodes, uh, sexual deprivation, fear, mass suicides, test emotions of people who have known to be addicts, those that haven't tested violence, and so forth, and have a testing program, an experimental program where you don't give a damn about the people but test them, and the, and the 
uh, problem was that if any person came in, whether it was Congressman Ryan or any single person, if any person came into there, they may see the seeds of what you saw at Auschwitz or Dachau or Treblinka. In the event that an invading army came, whether it was one news person or one person who left with information, in the event that they came, there had to be a contingency plan to destroy all people involved because we would find out that they had electrode implants or experimentation stages. And I'll go into this uh, further in detail. I think this is why the Ghana government didn't go in, our State Department didn't go in, until those bodies were rotted beyond uh, recognition. The Army could have been in in four hours. Our fleet was in Cuba and Guantanamo. We have military bases in Venezuela, certainly over in Trinidad and all around. And that besides that, the property was rented by Jim Jones, who's an American citizen. So I don't see how much it had to do with the Ghana government. There was an airport there. We had experience in jungles in Vietnam. He had clearings there. He had vegetable guards where helicopters could arrive to take dead bodies away so they could have arrived on the premise to come in with troops immediately. The minute a woman was killed in Georgetown and her children, three children, had their throats cut, the troops should have been in there within hours. And if it was dark at night, they should have been in there in the morning. And I believe that uh, there were about 45 people in Georgetown that lived in Jonestown, 126 miles away, who could have identified the bodies within 24 hours, and families could have been flown down from San Francisco. They had the list of members there. They could have been down within eight hours or gone to New York, then down to Georgetown. It wasn't that difficult. It didn't have to cost $10 million to send them to Dover Airfield in Delaware and have the bodies decayed and rotten and out in the sun. I think the reason they stalled was to make sure that it would be impossible to determine anything on them or to see their faces, and uh, that's why I think they were lying face down because many of these children were wards of the Court of California. They all came from San Francisco, and the juvenile court had given them to Jim Jones for experimentation. And uh, I'll back this up with uh, research I had done in 1972 and 73, and somebody would recognize that their kids had been shipped down there. In the circumstances under which they died, uh, the children were forced by the adults to take poison. It wasn't a suicide. It was a murder. And those that didn't take it were going to be shot. And because there's no autopsy, they can't determine cause of death. They've already embalmed them. And they can't get insurance because they're not identified. And there's a lot of complications here. And not one single one of them had to take place. They could have been in there within eight hours and cleared everything out or been well on their way to clearing it out. The contingency was that in case anybody found out what was going on in that place, everyone would have to die. They had the weapons. They had the cyanide. They had drugs. They had tranquilizers. And the key is... What did they have to know? If these were simply poor black people uh, down in a community in uh, South America, why would you need hit squads now with 2 to $3 million to float around and murder anybody that talks? The only thing they could talk about is what they were doing down there. These were poor people, no education, as I say, drug acts, some white, not that many, a handful of people. And what in the world would be the secret if they wanted to go with him, if they were mesmerized with him, if they took suicide, like Time Magazine says, the cult of death was a cult of death. The people inside the compound or the 40 or 50 people in Georgetown now who kept the rank, the goon squads, to murder anybody who got out. And the cast of characters, of course, I'll go into the background and biography of where they got their education, medical training. So far, there's only been one doctor named out of a medical team of 70, this Dr. Shock, who went to medical school in Mexico. And he administered the cyanide with a nurse, uh, and he's dead, or they said he's dead. We don't know about the nurse. But the first section I'm doing under Roman numeral one will be chronology, the summary of the purpose, which I say, and later you'll see why I believe it was a center for experimentation. Uh, as I say, these are the boys from Guiana. And because of his time in Brazil with the CIA and wanting to go to Argentina and traveling and money and food brought to him by the American embassy, it could easily have been a continuation even of cloning or experiments on women or children. 
See, we don't know what was going on because the bodies were all turned over face down and were rotted before any person was allowed, and then only the U.S. Army, after they were completely rotten and putrid in the sun. So it's impossible to look in their uteruses or in their bodies and even begin to know what kind of experiments were capable. I believe Time Magazine or Newsweek said this week that there were electrodes done on the children's arms and legs, and that's the kind of experimentation I think was going on down in Jonestown. Not a very pretty picture, is it? But this is what I think was going down in Jonestown. The section I'm doing under Roman numeral two has to do with uh, the contingency plans specifically. Uh, a, suicide. The suicide studies of the CIA, the suicide studies such as Candy Jones telling herself, being told to kill herself, the suicide study of the SLA that they tried to say uh, they wanted to die inside that burning house where actually they were shot at close range because they tried to leave the house, the Jim Jones suicide shot where he is shot in the head lying on the floor and the gun that shot him is several, two or three buildings away. How in the world can you call that suicide? The gun wasn't even down by his side if he wanted to die. Uh, we know that the CIA has done studies on suicides, so this really is tantamount to cold-blooded murder. It can't be a suicide when you study suicides and have a captive audience and force them to drink a poison or be shot. We'll do more on the next side on this outline I've done. Side two of tape 365, and it's December the 1st, 1978, Mary Russell and Carmel. In addition to the suicide studies, I think it's important to separate the division of uh, not only who was murdered at close range, who died among this huge amount of people, but who lived. As I said, there's people under house arrest uh, right now in Guyana. There's still 40 or 50 under house arrest in a hotel. It'll be interesting to see if they're all white. I understand that the goon squad, known as a basketball team, was in Georgetown and uh, the day that the mass, so-called suicide, the forced murders took place, and that they're the cleanup team and that these are the people that the handful of remaining people are afraid of because they were the torturers the people that did the beatings, that watched the field workers for 12 hours, you know, and had guns to see that no one escaped and so forth, um, who lived. We know Mark Lane and Charles Gary lived, but uh, the question was uh, how many blacks, the handful that flew in to Kennedy Airport this week, but the question is uh, how many out of that whole group are the goon squad that will not be prosecuted for killing the people in the compound. You see, they will be, we'll be told that those people chose suicide. And I guess the only murder charges will probably be the ones for the congressman and the newspaper people and the shooting of the aides at the airport and not for the murders in inside Jonestown. It's as if those people had no legal right. Uh, they were forced to die, and nobody will be charged for their death. Now, one important uh, category of research to follow in this are the finances, the money that Jim Jones had uh, in Indiana, and then the money in Brazil and up in Ukiah, San Francisco, and the purchase of Ghana, and then the cold cash he had left, the use of aliases of various people involved here, and, of course, there's the Telltale Diary. It wouldn't go without a good communist plot, even though uh, he was accused or they suggested they had been with the CIA in Brazil and that had at U.S. Embassy and higher-ups in the federal government. Right away on the corpse, there was supposed to be a suicide note left talking about communism and the remark made when these millions of dollars were put in a footlocker told to take out to the jungle was give it to the Soviet Embassy. I'm very sure that it wasn't intended for the Soviet Embassy. But that was the story 
when the fascist concentration camp broke apart, they still thought of saving the money. In fact, uh, the men that took the money out had seen their wife and children die inside. And instead of rushing in to save them, they took the trunk with the money and went out in the forest. Of course, it'll be interesting to see the past arrest of Jim Jones and uh, his links with organized crime. That's one section of its own. And in the psychological profile of Jim Jones, you see all kinds of stories about being lonely as a child, and his mother worked in a factory, and his father was gassed in World War One. And we get that human interest story that we got about Lee Harvey Oswald and his family, or James Earl Ray and his family. I remember Life magazine had a picture of James Earl Ray after he was charged with killing Martin Luther King, and it made out that they were terrible derelicts that hand them out the poorest kind of people hardly existing, and now you hear the House Select Committee on Assassinations telling about the high tentacles of politics that James Earl Ray's two brothers had in St. Louis, Missouri, and the contract to kill Martin Luther King, and um, they had clout around town, even though they are real bums. They were with the extreme right wing, and they were hardly uh, separated because he was just a loner. We'll get that psychological profile of Jim Jones as compared to the political clout he had. It's interesting that the State Department got more mail on Jim Jones than almost any single thing in the year 1977-1978 and assured everybody that they had been to Gannett from Georgetown to Jonestown uh, oh, at least 20 times or more and that everything was all right. Uh, it was only Congressman Ryan who had direct experiences uh, friends of his or constituents that had disappeared or died and that met, touched his heart and that he personally said, what the hell, I'm going down there. The State Department did nothing to protect the people down there. They were told of these beatings and articles were written. New West had an article. Um, the co other congressmen seemed to pass it off and uh, everyone passed the buck. The FBI, the State Department, and uh, I think they did it with good reason because if it was, a medical control center, then they were ordered not to touch it. It's similar to the Manson family being at the Spawn Ranch in California, and the sheriff's office got complaints all the time, and they were ordered to turn the face down and not to touch it, that, that you don't touch Charlie. And I think the federal government from Jimmy Carter and Mr. Brzezinski right on down through health, educational welfare, and every government agency was instructed, don't touch them, but the event, in the event that the armor is cracked, then everyone be prepared to die. And I think that after New West and after Congressman Ryan got interested in this and some lawsuits were coming up in San Francisco, they had to go ahead and kill everybody before anyone got any idea of what was going on there. I will take all of the articles on the Ukiah Church and study those. He went from Brazil with $100,000 and opened up a mental institution in Ukiah, which could be the beginning of mind and brain control. It was called Happy Acres, and it wasn't just a Happy Acres farm. There was a guard, watchdogs, a watchtower, sentinels, barbed wire. There was secrecy wherever Jim Jones goes, and if he has the clout to make social changes, produce votes, and be among the in crowd, there's a picture again in People this week of him with George Moscone and Rosalind Carter. He had protection of a kind because it's really hard to break that inner circle unless you're producing something that the government wants. And to be able to produce uh, 2,000 votes is nothing. Martin Luther King could have a million people behind him at the Washington Monument, the Poor People's March, or a half a million. And he had no barbed wire and no guns and no stories of beating and clubbing. So the protection that he had from the San Francisco police, the juvenile courts, the um, Attorney General's office in California, the United States Attorney General, the Congress, the State Department, the Guiana government, the protection he had is totally different than the profile. The blame will be put on Jim Jones for what happened just as World War II was put upon Adolf Hitler or Watergate was put upon Richard Nixon. But it's only a fraction of the problem, and that's one thing to keep very clear, is that the funding and the political clout before the act was very, very powerful. But that not only was powerful, but what did they do after uh, Congressman Ryan was there? The main thing to keep in mind out of all of this is that no matter what kind of a nut 
uh, Jim Jones was. No matter what he said he wanted, no matter how the people fell for him, what they gave him, he had the clout that after a United States congressman was killed and some major newspaper people from this country, after they were killed, Guyana government that was put in by the CIA wouldn't touch the place. Guyana first said, uh, we can't come in until the next day. It's 5 o'clock at night, and it's dark, and everyone had to stay out in the darkness. The first hint that the government had a hands-off policy was that there was an Army plane, Guyana uh, persons at the airport, and when these shootings took place and these dead bodies were on the ground, uh, the survivors ran over and said, we need some help. They had some guns, and they said, no, we can't interfere. And then it got dark, and the next statement was, we can't interfere. The radio towers mysteriously went out in Jonestown on Saturday morning. Their only communication was San Francisco. There were no telephones. It reminded me of the police car um, in Dallas, Texas, after Kennedy was killed at the switchboards at the White House, or the police cars in Memphis, Tennessee, that uh, radio communication was cut off for a few moments. At Jonestown, radio tower to San Francisco wasn't working. And the excuse for not getting in was that it was dark, even though we have helicopters that can light up the whole jungle. We've used them in Vietnam, and the LAPD uses them to light up parts of town, and they are available and not too far away. Then they said they were moving troops in cautiously, but on foot, and they had a long way to go in by foot, which just stalled time to get in there to see who was alive or who could be saved. And then they said they were flying in airplanes from... Uh, the United States, but they'd have to be assembled in Georgetown and put together there. Every stalling device was used. I have a Washington Post from the Thursday after the murders. The deaths were on Saturday, and by Thursday they were sending in U.S. troops for bodies to get the bodies where they could have come in four days earlier, and everything was rotten and smelly and more difficult and expensive uh, to identify, they, so there's no money to send the bodies back to San Francisco, but the four days that they rotted in the sun made the work so expensive into the millions of dollars and storing in Dover Air Force Base in Delaware, the whole process of delaying it made it expensive, and instead of sending them right to San Francisco where they could be handled, they sent them back there. Everything smacked racism. Uh, some of the survivors were supposed to be sent to Charleston, South Carolina, according to a refugee uh, redistribution point or relocation, and they didn't even say anything about returning them to San Francisco, but to put them in South Carolina, where HEW would give them some money and they could pay the government back and work back as if they haven't worked hard enough. Many of these people were elderly people that had worked all of their life, that had homes they had given to Jim Jones, and they had savings, and they had Social Security checks, and the checks Many, many of them were going down there. And instead of cashing those for each person and using that one month's check for their burial, that goes into lump sums to pay back the government for delaying the body processing and fingerprinting. And it doesn't go back to the individual who's left in some refrigerator or coffin in Delaware at the present time. So some were to be relocated in South Carolina for whatever reason I can't imagine. Yes, I can imagine. I take it back. I think I know what it was, as I said before. I think there's something they don't want you to see on these people. The first people to come home, the first seven or eight that came in Kennedy Airport are aged people. If they're senile, if their memory is gone, we can say they're in a state of shock. We haven't seen them for a long time, if ever before. And they sent the oldest, there are a few old people in. But there's no way of knowing the state of mind of uh, whether these people were experimented on the younger people because they're dead and they're rotted. In 1972, uh, Dr. Jolly West of the CIA, who was Jack Ruby's uh, doctor at the time of the trial for shooting Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, had moved out to California to the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute, where they planned a center for the study and reduction of violence. This is Ronald Reagan's baby, and if he gets to be president, you can be sure they'll pull this one out again, out of the woodwork. By, this was planned in 1972, and the plans were submitted to the California Department of Health in Sacramento in April of 1973. And I'd written an article about this uh, Neuropsychiatric Institute, exposed it as being part of the CIA, 
and said that it would involve third world people. It would involve the poor, the in the prisoners, the Indians. And I had a pamphlet here from a demonstration about this experience. It said, will the violence be against our children, third world, world people, women, prisoners, sexual minorities, uh, and such as homosexuals and gays or lesbians, mental patients, and you? What is happening, I had asked, about Jolly West? And I had some questions to answer. Well, a group of us got a hold of the presentation papers in Sacramento for the funding uh, for this institute, this Neuropsychic Institute at UCLA, which came really under LEAA Health Education and Welfare, but they wanted some California money also. And one of the studies that was to be done was an S.M. Heilig, H-E-I-L-I-G, doesn't even say doctor, he's got MSW, who wanted to study trends in self-directed violence and find out why there's so many suicides among young. And one of the studies was to work on suicide. Another was on violence in hyperkinetic children, and they would have child guidance clinics and study school-aged children who suffer from this, in quotes, condition. doesn't say anything about the parents being drugged or divorced or poverty or no jobs, unemployment, 10 or 12 to a room, television night and day, high sugar, white flour diet, if anything. Uh, they were to study these children, and one of the plans was to take mass amount of youth from the Los Angeles area and use them for experimentation and compare them to other children, normal children, as against hyperkinetic children, or suicidal people as against non-suicidal a Sidney Cohn, who's on television all the time, an MD, was to study LSD and uh, psychopharmacological effects of marijuana, heroin, and so forth. Another study was the prediction of violence. Now, this was the important thing. They were going to take well people and guess whether they had the potential for violence. American Indians, poor blacks, women, they were to do a study that I have here on, on whether women are violent when they menstruate, and they were to take... Uh, cult murders, this is one of the subjects, a Dr. Jivan Tabibian, a Ph.D., not an M.D., was to study skyjackings, cult murders, and violence by fanatics. They had a long list of um, subjects that they were going to study, and among them were the possibilities that this Jonestown was moved down. When I read the parallel of studies of mass suicide, former drug addicts, women, black, potentially violent, deprived, uh, good uh, cross-section of women, sexual fantasies and problems, which is what he instilled in them, telling them they had to be homosexuals and then they could study it. Um, I thought this uh, outline of what they planned in 1972 and 73 was interesting in lieu of the fact that so many welfare children were sent from a continuation school in the San Francisco area in Oakland down to Jonestown, they were given to Jim Jones, this fanatic, this racist, bigot, torturer, uh, man filled with sexual fantasies and fears, and quotes, problem children from the Bay Area, and all these people came from the Bay Area, were shipped down there. Now, we fought, we, means a handful of people, demonstrated up in Sacramento and fought this school, this neuropsychiatric uh, study that was supposed to center on violence. This was in 19... 73, but it began to be started in 1972. And then in 1974, the Committee of the Judiciary of the United States Senate, and I've given you the address on the printed sheet, had an uh, inquiry into individual rights and the federal role in human behavior, a book of 648 pages. And a good hunk of that book has to do with that UCLA Neuro Neuropsychiatric Institute and one of the things uh, Sam Irvin wanted to know, Senator Sam Irvin, uh, he wrote a letter, I want to know whether Dr. William Sweet, Dr. Vernon Mark, or Dr. Frank Irvin will perform any work at UCLA Project. I understand that Dr. Sweet and Irvin are now associated with the Neuropsychiatric Institute of UCLA and that they're closely aligned with types of projects to be conducted. Their work in the past has raised questions with regard to the constitutional right of the subjects of their experiments. Now, Drs. Vernon Mark and Dr. Frank Irvin and Dr. William Sweet uh, went on the theory that the reason the blacks rioted in Newark and Detroit in 1967 is that there's something in the black makeup that causes some blacks to violence and others don't, 
and they, they began brain experiments and electrode implants at Boston Hospital in Massachusetts after the 67-68 riots. They began experimenting mental programs on blacks of all kinds and poor to see what makes them trigger off or how can we keep them happy. And then they moved out to UCLA to start working with his Neuropsychiatric Institute. Now, one of the things that was so frightening about that institute was the fact that they wanted a secret base, which reminds me very much of Jonestown. Incidentally, one of the coordinators of this neuropsychiatric project was James Fisk, a former high-ranking officer in the Los Angeles Police Department who was linked to the criminal conspiracy section that Lewis Tacklin had talked about and was teaching political science at UCLA. On page 357 of this uh, book, I'll give you some quotations in the printed sheet, uh, or give you the full letter. There's a letter by Dr. Lewis Jolyon West, who was also identified at the time of the Senator Church hearings in 1976 as positively working with the CIA. He had written to J.M. Stubblebine. Mr. Stubblebine, at the time we were protesting this institute, was head of State of California Department of Mental Health. And he had written to Dr. Stubblebine, Stubblebine, and he said, Dear Stubb, I am in possession of confidential information to the effect that the Army is prepared to turn over Nike missile bases to the state and local agencies for non-military purposes. They may look with special favor on health-related applications. Now, this is the Federal Army that has missile bases, Nike missile bases, that they would turn over to the mental health department and a CIA doctor, Dr. West, who was working with men who were experimenting on blacks, poor blacks, Indians, children, and women, and they would give them this property. Such a Nike missile base is located in the Santa Monica Mountains within a half hour's drive of the Neuropsychiatric Institute. That's UCLA, University of California, at Los Angeles. It is accessible, but relatively remote. Does that remind you of Jonestown? That is accessible. It's on a river. Boats came and go. Open harbor for weapons, medications, drugs, people visiting, but remote. It has its own airstrip, and the people in Guyana hardly knew the place existed after this came down and removed from Georgetown. And this uh, neuropsychiatric institute would remove from Los Angeles proper. He said it's accessible, but it's remote. This site is securely fenced includes various buildings and improvements, makes it suitable for prop occupancy. If this site is available to the Neuropsychiatric Institute as a research facility, perhaps as an adjunct to our new Center for the Prevention of Violence, we could put it to very good use. We could make comparative studies that would be carried out there in an isolated but convenient location of experimental or model programs for the alteration of undesirable behavior. Now, this is important because Jim Jones was always telling them they were bad, that they were naughty, that they were guilty. They had to write letters if they didn't like uh, his place and go to the United States. They were stripped and punished. They were put, children were thrown down wells and put under water till they almost drowned. They were put under boards and locked up from one to six days under floorboards, empty, hollow spaces they were put. Uh, they were told they were naughty and bad and they had undesirable behavior and they punished them. They used forms of punishment and drugs. Dr. Jolly West, such programs might include the control of drug or alcohol abuse or modification of chronic antisocial or impulsive aggression. Now, Jim Jones uh, diagnosed these people as having sometimes chronic antisocial a behavior. They couldn't eat dinner if they worked 12 hours a day until he gave a sermon and then told them they could eat. If he gave a sermon for six hours, they had to listen. If they objected, they were antisocial. They couldn't have male and female boy or girl friends. Uh, they had to stay apart, sexually deprived, deprived of food, deprived of sleep. They simply worked all day. This is the work crew, the slaves, 14 people in those rooms, 10 by 12, and then if they behaved in a way that was impulsive or aggressive, they could be drugged and tested. And the pur purpose of this program in the Santa Monica Mountains, given by a military base, was to check antisocial behavior, impulsive aggressiveness. 
Dr. Jolly West went on and said the site could be an accommodation for conferences or retreat for instructions of selected groups of mental health related professionals or other law enforcement personnel, parole officers, and special educators, educators for whom demonstrations and participation would be effective modes of instruction. Now, this was written by Dr. Jolly West January 22nd, 1973, when they were going to get the Nike bases to test these poor people and deprivations and call in people for conferences. And that's why when I started this tape, I told you Mark Lane said that doctors came from everywhere. It was a model medical clinic after the murders came down of 914 people at least. They found syringes, needles, drugs, poisons, and it was a huge medical clinic as much as it was anything else, a non-educational institution. So who came for the conferences? Were these people being tested, controlled, electrodes, lobotomies, cloning? Were any of the women pregnant that had to be let to die? Were they implanted like Adolf Hitler did? Uh, he said he didn't want a birth rate, but were there experimentations? of not male with female so that you wouldn't know if a woman got knocked up. Maybe he kept them separate with their homosexual relationships so that they could practice artificial insemination or cloning or taking seeds from women. We won't know what happened because there's a contract out to kill anybody who talks, but you have to ask these questions hard and clear because sometimes in the last two weeks I felt guilty that I – uh, went with a group of people, and as I say, there weren't many of us, and we, I had friends in prison that would have been victims of these electrode testing implants and so forth, such as Hugo Pinnell, the defendants of the San Quentin Six. There were people that I knew would be the first ones sent down there that I knew personally, and I went up there and fought it and demonstrated, and the team had a conference at uh, UC Santa Cruz, and I fought that too. So I have to ask the question, if the Jonestown Machetes began to be broken. The land was purchased, and it began to escalate in 1974. as a clearing place with a medical clinic. Jim Jones himself didn't move down there until the New West article came out questioning what he was doing, his practices, and so forth. In 1977, he went down there for good because uh, he was being fingered or linked to politicians on, up in uh, California, too. And there was a custody fight over a child that he wanted to keep. He stayed down there. But to me, with my way of thinking, this is the only secret that would allow those bodies to rot beyond the time that they could do autopsies, to allow no press people in to see them, to turn everybody face face down so you wouldn't see who was there, to have the contingency plan to murder any single person. You see, if the people left, with Congressman Ryan, like this one woman did, and she was shot at point blank, they would talk and tell what was going on. One girl, Debbie, did leave and pleaded with people to investigate, and now her brother is being uh, charged for killing Congressman Ryan and the others. And if all of this had been listened to when she pleaded with them, when she escaped from there through a ruse to get out and came back up to Berkeley, California, if they had listened to her, all of these people would be alive. But I don't think they were meant to be alive, and I wonder what kind of tests they were doing or if anyone was keeping a record of the tests of sexual and emotional deprivation, lack of food, lack of sleep, constant guards. What would Jim Jones gain from this? They say, well, he got power from uh, these people, too much power. But it doesn't explain why the State Department wouldn't touch him, how he knew Rosalind Carter by telling her you can write call me at my special agency phone, how he was with the CIA in Brazil, where he got his 100000 to go to Ukiah, how he broke federal communication laws by having conversations on radio towers that are strictly for business. How did he do all that, accumulate links to organized crime, millions of dollars, hit squads for anyone who talks? It had to do with some secrets, dark secrets behind those walls. Now, Jolly West concluded his his letter to Mr. Stubblebein, M.D., he said, my understanding is that a direct request by the governor, that was Ronald Reagan, or another appropriate officer of the state or the secretary of defense would most likely produce prompt results. Needless to say, I stand available to participate in any way 
that might be helpful. Sincerely yours, Jolly West. There are 57 pages in this uh, Committee of the Judiciary hearings on the UCLA project. And so I have to ask the question, if it was canceled, were the intents of studying the juveniles, the Indians, the blacks, the women, were the intents to ship them down to Guyana from the San Francisco area, could they use a man with as much charisma as Jim Jones, whose father was in the Klan, who passed himself off as a liberal, as a man who helped the poor and loved the poor, but actually was an outright racist, and anyone around him knew it. He played tricks with their minds. He did magic trips on curing their diseases. One of the interesting things is that uh, the day before the hearings uh, were finished and the report was done, there was a letter pleading for this neuropsychiatric institute to begin, and a man working under Ronald Reagan at the Education, uh, Welfare, Health and Welfare Secretary, Earl Bryan, wrote, in just four years in California, and these are what I call the California murders, we've had 62 mass murders by sick individuals. See, no links or no conspiracies by six individuals, and it said just last Tuesday we saw the killing of Oakland School Superintendent Marcus Foster, and on the basis of the killing of Dr. Foster last Tuesday, we have to go ahead and study these causes of violence. Now, that we was, then learned in January or February 1974 that Dr. Foster was killed by Romero and Little of the CIA, and uh, of course I had written extensively the SLA is the CIA, and uh, it was a group of Nazis that said they were going to kill uh, this man who was working, they called the salt and pepper man, a, a black man working as a white man. The black man got cyanide bullets, Dr. Marcus Foster, and the school uh, chief that worked with him uh, only got a regular bullet, and he's still alive today. And that triggered off the notorious Feminist Liberation Army. At the end of the appeals of the group that wanted the study of violence, that institute down there, they said that there's callous disregard for public safety, so we have gone ahead and initiated a special task force within the Department of Health to study the existing laws and the administrative regulations relating to mentally disordered criminal offenders and that they complain, uh, the powers that be that wanted this, Earl Bryan complained, that his hands were tied in initiating the, the Center for the Study and Reduction of Violence. It was pigeonholed by the legislation, the California legislation that year, and that they would have to go about finding a, another means, uh, go ahead and get a special force going. And what I fear is that because the California Assembly cut off the money for the school to study the causes of violence at UCLA, that it went into Jim Jones' operation and was shipped down to Guyana. And that is possibly the place where people could be tested. And when anybody came in to see what was happening, they were all prepared to die, and those that weren't were poisoned. My worst fear is that the State Department, HEW, the FBI, the San Francisco Police, the Los Angeles Police, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the Defense Department all knew what was going on in Guyana, and therefore... When Congressman Ryan went there, they had to let him die and be sacrificed. This is a broad subject, and I hope that my first week on this isn't too confusing. We'll do much more in the weeks to come. And if you have any questions, write or call me, and I'll put them on the tape for you and include them in the tapes. This is Mae Bressel and Carmel. Next week, I'll also do more about the killing of Mayor Moscone and Harvey Milk in San Francisco and the links to People's Temple. <laughs>